Hey geeks and geekettes, it's Chuck Dixon back to answer your questions about what I do for a living. And what I do for a living is I write comic books. And we got some good inquiries into uh, inside baseball and comic books and um, inside the mind of a comic book writer who, to quote Bob Burton, always uses the wrong part of his brain. Okay, first question is from uh, my good buddy Scott Heilman. What was your first encounter with Conan, Sword and Sorcery, Sword and Sandal? I'm assuming there's a difference, the last two, with one being fantasy and the other historical. Any recommendations in this genre of someone were wanting to write in that? Well, okay, uh, there's Seymour. Uh, but to your main question, um, back in the day, paperback books were everywhere. They were... In drugstores and five and dines, five and dines. Boy, am I dating myself. Um, you know, everywhere you went, train stations, airports, there were racks and racks of paperbacks. And when I was a young man of about uh, maybe 12 years old, my family was staying in Stone Harbor, New Jersey for a couple of weeks. It was our summer vacation down at the shore. And uh, it was a Sunday. Once upon a time, kids, there was something called Blue Laws. And blue laws determined that certain businesses could not be open on Sunday. Uh, and one of those businesses in New Jersey were drugstores. Well, anyway, I'm out walking. Maybe, I think I was walking my dog. And I'm walking down the street in Stone Harbor, New Jersey, and I walk past the Rexall drugstore, and I can see in the window. And being an inquisitive kid who loves books, I'm looking at the paperback rack through the window of the drugstore on a Sunday afternoon. And... Uh, it's a long rack. I mean, it's a good 40 feet long, and it's packed with paperbacks because, you know, all this beach reading. And in that morass of paperback books, I can see one cover. Now, it's tiny. It's itty-bitty. It's way back, back there in the store, but I can see it. I can pick it out. I don't know what it is, but I'm fascinated. Absolutely fascinated. Out of this, this colorful melange of paperback covers with, you know, garish paintings of half-naked women and violent men. I'm picking this one out. This particular violent man. This particular, well, entirely naked woman, apparently. Um, and, and all I can see is the composition. Boy, Frank Frazetta, hats off to you. I'm looking at this thing from 40, 50 feet away, and I'm a nearsighted kid. I got, I got Coke bottle bottom glasses on, and I can still pick this image out. Of, of all that morass. And that's my first exposure. The very next day, I was there when that drugstore opened, Monday morning. I had to see what the hell that book was. And I bought it, and I fell in love with it. I fell in love with Conan. I bought all the rest of the Lancer paperbacks as they came out, and I just became a devotee. So yeah, I was an avid Conan reader, and this was my first introduction to sword and sorcery. And still the best, in my opinion. I really can't recommend any. I mean, I, yeah, I went on to Lord of the Rings, and I read some Fritz Lieber uh, or Lieber, uh, Fafford, and the Grey Mouser stories. Uh, but really, for me, in the reign of sword and sorcery, it begins and ends with Conan. Now, reading Conan and writing Conan are two different things. And two people were heavily influential on how I would approach writing Conan once I got the assignment. The first of these is Larry Hama, who gave me the assignment. He initially hired me to write Cull, King Cull or Cull the Conqueror backups in Savage Sword of Conan, these little eight-page stories. And uh, I kept pestering him with plot lines for the main feature. I wanted to write those big, honking, fat, 50-page, black-and-white extravaganzas. And uh, he told me to stop pestering him, but I wouldn't. And I kept submitting plot lines, and eventually he took me on board, and eventually I was the regular writer on Savage Sword of Conan. Now, I had a lot to figure out, but Larry guided me with all his various rules. One of them was he wanted the stories to be brutal as hell. Uh, he didn't care about Conan, comic book continuity, or any of the rest of that. He just wanted these stories to be badass, and Conan to be the biggest badass in comics, which, you know, he, he was and is and probably always will be. And um, he had other rules. He didn't like Wizard of the Week and Monster of the Month stories. <laughs> In other words, uh, the easiest way to write a Conan story is to you know, introduce an evil wizard with some weird power 
and Conan has to uh, figure out a way to destroy him uh, or introduce a new monster, you know, a giant spider, a giant rat, you know, a, a giant armadillo, whatever, whatever it would be. Uh, and Larry didn't want any of that. He wanted um, he, he, he wanted the stories basically rooted in uh, history, the way Howard wrote them. Howard, um, you know, the, the Hyborian Age is kind of an amalgam of all the ancient civilizations uh, with their names changed. And Larry wanted me to lean a lot into that, the, the warfare and, and all the rest of it. And uh, so Larry was a, a big guide in this stuff. Uh, he told me to read Lord Dunsany, which I did. I read quite a bit of Lord Dunsany. He said that would inform me on the fantasy elements. Now, fantasy elements were the thing I was least attracted to in Conan. Magic. I didn't get magic. I didn't really like magic. Uh, I, I preferred, you know, the sword swinging and axe wielding, all that, to the spell casting. Still, still don't really care all that much for the magic. And, um... Gary Quapis, who would be, you know, my most frequent collaborator on Conan, um, and, you know, I, I explained this to him. I said, I'm not really comfortable with this whole magic act. It all seems kind of fey to me. It doesn't seem to really even belong in Conan, these wizards and warlocks and witches and things like that. They seem more at place in, in fairy tales. And Gary gave me a piece of advice that has served me to this day on how to write magic. Gary said that to him, magic has a price. In other words, if you're going to indulge in the dark arts, you're going to have to sacrifice something. And, you know, his idea was, you know, that every time a wizard casts a spell, it costs him 10 years of his life or a scar appears on him, you know, or he loses something valuable to himself, you know, like, like he's got to sacrifice a child or, you know, treasure or something to, to make this magic work. Um, you know, he's got to spill blood. And I really like that idea. And it stuck with me. And it's, it's how I made magic work for me. And it's how I made the idea, you know, forget about Harry Potter. It's how I made the idea of, you know, of wizards and magicians and geomancers and all the rest of them work, that these are people who were so into this uh, pseudoscience or quasi-science that they were willing to uh, basically harm themselves to use it uh, in exchange for whatever it is they thought they were going to get in return. And I, I understood that. It was kind of deal with the devil kind of stories. And uh, I got all that, you know. Um, so, you know, Gary and I and a number of other artists, Ernie Chan as well, but mostly Gary, uh, you know, was for the next five years worked on Coney. Uh, loving every minute of it. Uh, doing the, the research on historical periods and weaponry and things like that, and then trying to find, um, you know, interesting supernatural challenges. Uh, I kind of switched between straight-up historical action stories and supernatural stories. Uh, I, so I, I would inter I introduce vampires, I introduce werewolves, you know, kind of monsters I was comfortable with. And then eventually, I think I was on the book maybe a year, and Larry, uh, Larry told me on a visit to the offices, that the H.P. Lovecraft monsters have now become public domain. So it was very natural addition because um, Robert E. Howard was part of the Lovecraft circle, the Cthulhu circle. Uh, it was very natural to sort of fold Conan into the Lovecraft universe and start using yogg Sagoth and Dagon and all these other characters. So that, that solved a lot of my monster and supernatural. And, and, it made the magic and supernatural stuff make even more sense because Lovecraft's creatures were more of science fiction. They were more of science, uh, you know, alien creatures who ruled the earth in, age, in an age gone by. Uh, so it, that made even more sense and, and allowed me to get a firmer grasp on that aspect of Conan the Barbarian. So, so there you go. That was my first exposure and... Um, how I became immersed in, in writing it. Michael Hutchison asks, Chuck, what can you tell us about the first actor to play Bane in the 1990s? Well, that would have been Jeep Swenson. And uh, Jeep Swenson played Bane in, in the forgettable uh, camp classic, <laughs> Batman and Robin. 
uh, where George Clooney got to, you know, basically shirk his way through playing Batman. And um, they added Bane as a henchman for Uma Thurman's Poison Ivy. And that's all he was, was a henchman. Uh, you got a few lines like drive, drive, and bomb, bomb, and a lot of uggs and grunts. Um, but, it, you know, it brought him more into the Batman canon and it spawned a whole bunch of action figures, which I was happy about. Uh, but, yeah, what can I tell you about the actor? Um, he was a, a wrestler and a bodybuilder. And the only reason I know this is I, I live in Tampa, Florida, which is the home of professional wrestling. It's where professional wrestling was born. Uh, and, and it's, um, a wrestler shared with me, I won't, I won't name the wrestler, but he shared with me that, uh, and I run into a lot of, a lot of wrestlers, uh, needless to say I'm in Tampa. Uh, so this, this particular wrestler told me that, that he was in training out in LA at the same time Jeep was in training to play Bane. And uh, he said, this guy was just a total animal. He never saw anybody work out the way this guy did. He just worked out constantly. And what he told me about Jeep was, is that Jeep actually was a supervillain. Uh, <laughs> Jeep had a police record. Jeep is no longer with us. I, I feel free to talk about this. And he might have even been proud of this. I think I'd be proud of it. Um, Jeep was a convicted felon. He was a breaking and entering guy. He would burglarize homes when people weren't there, thank God. And... Um, his M.O. was he would grab the door handle of your apartment door and tear the door off the hinges. <laughs> that was his M.O. And that's how the cops caught him, because they said all these burglaries have one thing in common. Somebody with the uh, <laughs> with the strength of 10 men tore this door off. They didn't use a tool. <laughs> and uh, so they started looking at gyms <laughs> and bodybuilders and weightlifters and exercise freaks and uh they, they found jeep and he did a little time but he, he never hurt anybody but he sure looked like he could have so that's that's all i know about jeep swenson uh who has unfortunately he is unfortunately no longer with us uh he sure looked good as bane okay um here's a question for you chuck do you think the deconstructionist writing style has taken more away from superheroes than it is given or has it been a worthwhile journey that has only added to the mystique of them and why? Well, I, I don't I don't think it's added anything. <laughs> deconstructing or um, yeah, deconstructing or revisionist on the superheroes, I just don't think it's a terribly good idea. I don't want to read about sad superheroes. Uh, I don't want to read about heroes with a feet of clay. I do not mind if my heroes have flaws, I, but I don't like it when they're flawed people. You know what I mean? There's a big difference between having a few flaws and being broken. And, uh, you know, when you go as far as making Batman incontinent, you've gone way too far. These are heroes. These are icons. These are mythical uh, yeah, people say this is the new mythology, but that's bull. The, the old mythology still exists. Uh, the old mythology was created for a reason, uh, and it wasn't commercial. So um, th these are, you know, pulp heroes. They're pop culture heroes. They're whatever you want to call them. But um, we have to be able to look up to them. They can't, you know, be kind of people who would make the dumb decisions you and I make <clears throat> or, or the cowardly decisions that we might make <clears throat> they don't run away from a fight they don't walk around from a, a fight um they're good principled uh, ideals paragons to what we wish we were and and we aren't anymore and um you know dc in particular uh has suffered by having their heroes be revealed to have feet of clay to be torn down now, these are the most famous comic book characters in the world, bar none. Now, I know Marvel movies make more money and, and all the rest of it, but um, you, you can go anywhere in the world and everybody knows who Superman and Batman are. Uh, you know, they're so famous that they can trade on their symbols alone. And, you know, these characters are indelible because they're basically childhood wish fulfillment fantasies. 
Uh, you know, when you're a kid, you, you wonder what kind of man or woman am I going to grow up to be? And these heroes sort of show away, you know, um, because they're, they're, they're principled and they, they have courage and they're loyal and, you know, they follow the rules and they take down the people that don't. And, you know, that's, that's just something to look up to. And DC has a, a rich pantheon of these characters. And people say, you know, DC characters, they're kind of stodgy and stuck in the mud and Boy Scouts. Yeah, but that's what they are because they're not written for adults. They weren't created for adults. They should not be, quote unquote, evolved into adult characters. Um, it diffuses them. It lessens them. It, it, it just, it's just a bad idea. It, it corrupts the original naive innocence. And, you know, you see these characters in these skin tight outfits, you know, colorful clothing. And yeah, that's what, that, that's for kids. That's kids like that. Um, if you move it into the area of adult interests, it, it seems fetishistic to me. It seems really odd <laughs> and perverse. So, so they should be left for the kids. It doesn't mean these stories can't be written or presented so that adults can enjoy them also, but that takes skill. That takes more skill, apparently, than people are willing to uh, apply. Now, when did the downfall of the hero begin at DC Comics? Well, it began with the arrival of the British writers. <laughs> when the Brits showed up, and DC hired a, a ton of them, uh, DC was hiring them before um, Marvel, and... Uh, the, the Brits had a different attitude toward heroism. They didn't, they didn't, you know, they didn't, they didn't really dig the American hero. And it's nothing against the Brits. This is their worldview. This is just who they are. Um, they, they sort of didn't even have a good attitude toward their own homegrown heroes. Uh, I mean, you look at characters they created uh, in England, you know, popular characters like Judge Dredd. Judge Dredd is, he acts very much like a villain. Uh, and Judge Dredd is very much a, uh, it's a parody of a hero. Uh, he's, he's beyond an anti-hero. Uh, and, you know, he's treated as the villain in his own stories. Uh, some readers can cheer what Judge Dredd is doing, but I think the writer's intentions are that you'll be appalled at what Judge Dredd is doing. And, uh, you know, this is, so these guys come to D.C. and they're, you know, they create their own cast of characters who are, you know, venal, vile, um, amoral, smoke a lot, apparently. And uh, they're, they're unlike, you know, the, the, the rest of DC's cast. But the thing is, they're, the editors aren't happy with just having these guys off in their own little corner. They, they hire them to write the iconic DC characters. And... Uh, these writers don't really like writing heroes, aren't interested in writing heroes, so they begin to pick at the threads <laughs> of the cape, if you will. Uh, you know, they sort of fray the edges and and blur things, and and, and the, the characters are if, revealed after a while to be you know morally suspect, uh, mean, you know, not nice people not paragons anymore. Uh, they show signs of weakness, moral turpitude. And it just sort of begins to edge in over a while. And uh, the material becomes darker and darker and darker. Uh, Denny O'Neill told me that one of the reasons I was brought on to Detective Comics was the regular writer on Detective Comics was, a, uh, I, I, I don't want to insult him. I, I think he was British, but he might have been Irish. He might have been a Scot. I'm going. I'm, he might have been Welsh. I'm sorry. I'm going to insult them no matter what um, um, ethnic group in the British Isles I, I assign to them. But um, Peter Milligan, uh, Denny told me, was had confessed to him that he had simply no interest in writing heroes, and you can tell by his writing on Batman. Um, he pretty much ignores Batman <laughs> for most of the stories and makes his stories about other things, and Batman is sort of tangential to them. And I think the straw that broke the camel's back for Denny was an art called The Idiot Root, 
in which um, you know Batman is is mentally compromised by the villain in the arc, and that sort of um, made Denny think he didn't want to bring Peter along for Nightfall because uh, you know he already had Doug and he had Alan. Now Alan is a Scot. He's a Highlander or a Lowlander. I don't want to insult him for that either. But Alan is uh, Alan gets heroes. He's he's a writer from the UK, but but Alan gets heroes and likes heroes and understands how to write them. So he and Doug Doug Mensch, of course, um, knows how to write paragons of virtue. So um, then he brought me on basically because it fit better his image that Denny is as, as world weary and cynical as Denny could be, he still thought these stories should be about hero heroic types, um, icons. And um, so there you have it. And, and it goes on to this day. I mean, um, the, the comics have just gotten so dark. I mean, my, my understanding is I haven't seen them. Is There's actually an adult line of comics in DC featuring Superman and Batman. And I can't begin to tell you how wrong that is. It is just wrong, wrong, wrong. These characters appear on children's pajamas. You know, leave them alone. <laughs> um, okay. Dan Donovan says, any plans on a video talking about the recent reorganization at DC? As you're both an industry leader and a historian, I'd be interested to hear what you think it means in the short and long term for DC specifically and the industry as a whole. Well, um, you know, once upon a time, a big change at DC would have meant something to the industry as a whole, but the industry is in the comics books, comic book publishing industry is in such a sad state now that I don't see how it's going to have any impact as DC fires, you know, a lot of their executives, uh, a bunch of their editors and shrinks their line down to almost nothing. I don't see where it's really going to hurt things. Um, you know, the, the industry was in a, a state of collapse even before the coronavirus showed up. Now, you know, everything's changed. DC is distributing the books themselves. Uh, apparently, they're going to lean more toward digital sales. And uh, because there's been a rise in digital sales uh, with the rise of the coronavirus, uh, so they're changing their focus and everything else. So it's going to have an impact on DC. But on the comic industry, I mean, what is the comic industry? With, with crowdfunding and digital and web comics and everything else, it's, it's more fragmented than it's ever been. I, I never foresaw it becoming this fragmented. Uh, but, you know, the decline of DC was pretty much, you know, in the cards as they just shifted their focus from producing quality comics to whatever the hell it is they're doing now. Um, and the problem with DC, I mean, these changes they're making now should have been made 20 years ago because uh, for, you know, the last 16 or 17 years, it's been the same people making all of the decisions. And they, they do reboot after relaunch, you know, after restart um, of, of these continuities, but it's always the same people doing them. So you got to think after the fifth, sixth, seventh time you've failed, that maybe you're not the person for the job. Maybe some new blood should be brought in, or even better yet, just hire some freelancers and let them go to town. Uh, don't have an Uber plan, you know, because your Uber plans always fail. Uh, think, you know, stop worrying about the content of the comics and concentrate more on how to market them. You know, that, that was the genius of Stan Lee. Uh, yes, he was concerned with the content and the quality of the comics, but he also was concerned about marketing them about getting the comics out there, about finding new audiences for them. So uh, what does it mean? I don't know, because I don't know what at and who I've heard are in charge of all these changes, I don't know what their intentions are. Um, you know, the lean toward digital makes me think they're going to rely more and more on their 80 years of, you know, uh, back stock, <laughs> you know, 80 years, literally, I don't know, what, is that millions of pages of comics that they can sell? Um, so I don't know. I don't know what their intentions are. Um, you know, you hear rumors, you hear whispering that, that AT&T has been unhappy with everything about the DCU, including the movies and television shows. Um, but I don't know. I don't know how deep it's going to go. I don't know how keen an interest they have. I don't know how keen an understanding they have of even how to change it. 
But um, I have to say, you know, I don't know everybody that got fired, uh, but I do know a few that got fired had it coming. Uh, they, they were not interested in producing quality entertainment. They were not interested in the future of D.C. They were primarily careerists. And so many of them were former Marvel employees, uh, and they were former for a reason. Uh, that's the weird thing. And apparently this era is over now because there's nowhere else to go. But, but people in comics who weren't good at it, who in the editing and publishing realm, just sort of moved from company to company. They never went away. They always found a place to land and get a job and produce more mediocre comics. Uh, but those days are over because the independents are in trouble. There's simply no place else to shift to. And uh, I guess they'll go to crowdfunding or something like that. And good luck, because it's a tough arena. It's hard to make it in crowdfunding. And uh, you've made a lot of enemies there already. <laughs> so uh, anyway, that's it. Until I know more, I really can't say, because I, I did say something on Facebook a few weeks back. And I was told by an insider who I trust that, that I was completely full of crap. <laughs> I didn't know what I was talking about. And, and I readily admitted, okay, I don't know what I'm talking about. I only know what I heard, and what I heard was wrong. So, but there you go. I sort of rambled a bit there. But, yeah, I don't know how much of an impact it's going to have, because how much worse can it get? Tommy Bagley says, Chuck, you're famously prolific with your output. Which projects of yours took the most research time before you ever put down words to paper? No contest. No contest. El Cazador. El Cazador is a pirate book. I did it at CrossGen. I did six issues with Steve Epting. And uh, both of us put a lot of work into making this book look authentic. Uh, if you don't know about CrossGen, it had an Uber story about some sort of, I don't know what it was. I never read the handbook. <laughs> I wrote for them for, for like two, three years, and I, I never understood the Uber story. I mean, I understood enough to write about it, but I didn't get why it was so important. But apparently, you know, everybody shared the same origin, and if you had the sigil marking, you had special powers or some special significance to the history of the universe or whatever. Well, Al Cazador was free of all that. It didn't take place on another planet. There were no zombies or werewolves or witches in it. It was just a straight-up pirate adventure, and it would be... Um, CrossGen's biggest selling title. Um, it's the direction we should have gone in. Anyway, um, Steve and I were dedicated to making sure that everything about this book was as historically accurate as we could make it. So we weren't going to do just enough research to get away with it, as you can so often do in comics. Also, we were going to need some solid visual reference. So we looked at tons and tons of artwork and all kinds of other stuff. And, um, you know, there's a lot involved in making a uh, pirate story accurate. And, you know, I think the only fans of fiction more rabid than Transformer fans are nautical fiction fans. And a lot of them are sailors themselves. And you damn well better get it right. And I am no kind of sailor. So, um, you know, a lot of research on all the aspects. The other thing that was um, a big boon to doing the series was because we were cross-gen and we were working on salary, uh, you know, we had time to do this research. And we also uh, convinced Mark Alessi to buy this program. It was a computer program uh, that would allow you to create wireframe models of all kinds of things and print them blue line onto Bristol board. So you can make wireframe models of pirate ships. And we bought like 12 different pirate ships, sloops and frigates and man of wars and ships of the line. And um, Steve was able to print out wireframes and then render them. As you can see here, it's these beautiful renderings. Now, now when he printed them out, they were just basically schematics with no shading or texture or anything else. And he added all of that. And uh, it was the only, really the only way we could do a monthly pirate title was uh, with the aid of that program. But, you know, there were other things to consider, all of the little details of clothing and things like that. And we didn't really want to look at movies because movies aren't always accurate. Uh, so, you know, we did a, spent, just spent a lot of time looking at guys like, you know, Howard Pyle and N.C. Wyeth and, and things like that. 
um, and books, books and books and books. We, we looked at knots, <laughs> books on knots to make sure they, they look convincing. Uh, rigging, I had to learn all about rigging because, you know, for the dialogue, you know, things like, you know, hard to leave. I had to learn what a vast meant <laughs> because in the dialogue, you know, they're going to be shouting out orders and I wanted them to make sense and I wanted to understand uh, what it took to sail one of these ships. You know, what, who was on the crew and all these other things. Uh, what was their task? You know, uh, what did it mean, you know, when they got up in the rigging and were pulling on things and somebody's shouting out jargon? Uh, weaponry. We had to look into weaponry, how it worked. Um, I, I even, well, I was, you know, situated in Tampa, which is where Crosstown was. I, I took a trip up to St. Augustine, which is south of Jacksonville. And there, there's a Spanish star fort from the pirate period. I mean, it was built to keep pirates out of um, the bay there in Jacksonville. And uh, I took, you know, lots of photographs and, and bought a bunch of reference books I never saw anywhere else but there. And um, I, I took, uh, I spent an afternoon taking photos of the artillery crew because every afternoon they would fire an artillery piece off into the bay at some imaginary buccaneer vessel and I took lots of pictures of all the steps of you know um, sponging out the barrel and loading it and priming it and setting the fuse and you know f eventually igniting it and uh, discharging the cannon so um, and I loved every minute of all this I mean El Cazador gave me a tremendous excuse to immerse myself into this period and uh, of course books first stop being the Osprey series of books uh, Osprey is an English publisher who publishes visual reference books for all kinds of historical periods. I mean, I can't think of one they haven't covered, and they continue to delve deeper and deeper into all of them. And uh, these provided lots of imagery, you know, historically accurate imagery of, um, you know, costuming, weaponry, and uh, all the rest of it. And um, the other one for language was a book I'd read as a kid, The Buccaneers of America, written by Exquemelin, and it was um, written in the period. Um, this guy had either been a captive of the pirates or met someone who was and interviewed them and, and wrote it as if it was him. I, I don't know if that's ever been clarified, whether Exquemelin was actually captured and, and, and held slave by the Buccaneers of America. But because it was written in period, it's invaluable for the language. I mean, he's talking in the language of the golden age of piracy. I don't think the people that were victims of pirates saw this golden age, but the pirates certainly did. Um, you know, the Spanish main and all that. My favorite books of all of the books that, that Steve and I found were the Borders Away volumes. And you can see here the post-it notes still in place where Steve placed them. Uh, Borders Away was two volumes of nothing but boarding weapons. Axes, pole axes, halberds, chains, um, you know, cannonades, all kinds of, you know, crazy blunderbusses and stuff like that. It was pages after page after page of imagery, uh, boat hooks, you know, things like that. And, and also in the text will describe the tactics and their use and everything else. And I love these books. Uh, as you can see, I kept them. Uh, and I look through them every once in a while. I just, I just think, and, you know, so that's the depth we went to. And, and by far, more research on El Caso or anything else I've ever worked on. And as I said, I, I, I enjoyed every minute of it. Here's an easy question. Where's the best place to ask questions? Okay, you can go on Facebook. I've got a, a regular Facebook page, Chuck Dixon. I've got another Facebook page, which is like an author page, also Chuck Dixon. Um, you can ask questions right on YouTube underneath the videos. I've pulled a few there. Uh, or simplest thing in the world to reach me directly. Send your question to Bruno Bookstore at gmail.com. And you send it there, and uh, I will definitely get it. I'll get it all the other ways too, but uh, it's easier to keep track of them uh, as an email. So, okay, that's it for this week, number 23 in the bag. Um, people have asked how they can contribute to help these things going. Well, I don't, I can't directly contribute. I don't have YouTube monetized. I do have a Patreon account under Arcaven Comics. 
Um, and the account there is, uh, I affectionately refer to it as the Chuck Dixon Slush Fund. Uh, we've got a lot of subscribers. You can subscribe for a dollar a month, three dollars a month, five dollars a month. And the money goes to pay our starving artists as we compile a whole bunch of great new projects coming up uh, for both digital and um, uh, mobile phone applications and print. So if you go to Patreon, look for Arcaven Comics, it's me. It's all me. I, um, I manage the fund and it, it helps me pay the artists. You can get a couple of previews of what's coming up. And I will also, um, pretty soon, we're going to have a whole bunch of stuff launched, uh, at least five new projects. As I said, in print, digital, and mobile phone applications. So that's it, my friends. Uh, I'm so glad you stopped by. I uh, had a lot of fun answering these questions. I hope I've informed you. I hope I've made your day a little brighter. <laughs> and I will see you all down the road.